All right, everybody, uh, we're just about set. It is 6.30, so we'll get started with our basic Skywarn class. My name is Eric Hayden. I'm a meteorologist with the Weather Service in Newport, Moorhead City, North Carolina. I understand a lot of you may be doing this for the first time. A lot of you may not be from our area. So we're going to go over some uh, ground rules with the class itself. At any point, you can ask a question. I'm doing the presentation right now, so I won't see it until the end. But if something pops up, uh, don't hesitate to ask a question, and we'll certainly answer those uh, at the end itself. This is actually the third year that we've done these classes. It's nothing new. With our current situation, we've certainly expanded our schedule. I'll have more on that in a second. If you're having any type of difficulty, visit our website. Uh, right now, we have the presentation itself as a PDF online. So if you have any technical issues, you can follow along that way. If you're hearing me, um, you're doing just fine with that, and you should be able to see me through your personal computer or mobile device. At the end of the uh, class, uh, it will be tomorrow, I will send you a course certificate to the email that you registered with uh, for uh, the class itself. As far as questions go, again, if anything's confusing, something um, doesn't make sense, you can ask a question through the program itself. Really easy to do. Nobody but myself will see it. Um, the other thing to go over is you can raise your hand uh, at the end if you have any questions. We'll um, open the lines up and you can actually um, ask it uh, over your um, device if you have a microphone. So we can do it that way as well. One last thing to point out, you may notice it says webinars recording. I'm not recording you. The whole presentation, my audio, um, the uh, visual itself is being recorded so that we can post it on YouTube afterwards. So don't don't think we're recording your webcam or anything like that. I just want to make sure folks uh, know that. Our main hope is you learn about who we're, we are as a weather service, a little bit about severe weather. We mentioned that certificate will be sent out to you um, by tomorrow morning. Sit back and enjoy. Uh, we're aiming for about 45 to 50 minutes, so we should aim uh, uh, or end the class about 7.15, and then we'll leave uh, 10 additional minutes for any questions that you might have. Before we go too much further in the presentation, I want to make sure I point out our website. You will be getting all these links, so uh, don't feel you need to jot everything down. We do a nice follow-up. In addition to the certificate, we'll send you some links to Coco Raws, which we'll talk about, and our Skywarn page. I do need your help. This class is our basic class for um, summer severe weather, tornadoes, hail, uh, things of that nature. We did add some other classes, a tropical Skywarn, an advanced Skywarn, which is a follow-up to this, and Coco Raws training. So if you know of anybody that didn't join us tonight and they're interested, please, please send them to our website. We put a lot of effort into this. Um, again, of course, we got the class tonight, but you'll see in total, we've scheduled 15 classes through the middle of April, um, not only Skywarn classes, but also hurricane preparedness class in early April. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, help us out in terms of getting the word out because I want to make sure people um, understand that we've got these classes available for them if they um, are interested and want to take it uh, for um, you know future reference. So we'll get back to the presentation itself. We mentioned this is the third year of uh, classes. This class, the main focus is summer severe weather, hail, high winds, tornadoes, heavy rainfall. We'll touch on uh, the storm structures, supercells, bow echoes, and then as we're doing that throughout the class, our main focus will be how to report that information to us. A couple things to keep in mind, there is some science with this. Uh, we just want you to know that so you understand how the atmosphere works. But our main goal is to report severe weather to us. And we're going to highlight that in yellow. We're going to focus over and over again what to report, how to report, and when. That's the most important part. Not that you understand uh, all of the science or why things happen. That's just for your own knowledge. The most important part is when you get bad weather, we want you to let us know about it. As far as um, the Weather Service goes, our main mission is to protect life and property. So while we do a seven day forecast, our main focus is, do we have any severe weather on the horizon? Do we have any issues with hurricanes, ice storms, blizzards? So we issue watches, warnings, and advisories. You might get them on your phone. You might see them from your favorite local broadcaster, but they start with the Weather Service. And that's our core mission, is that protection of life and property. 
We do this by having a bunch of different offices across the country. I mentioned that we are the Moorhead City office across, across far eastern North Carolina. If you've ever been to the Outer Banks, um, toward the Crystal Coast, Emerald Isle, that's where we're located. I know we have a lot of people on the line from all over the country. We actually had one person sign up from Honolulu, Hawaii. Very cool stuff. One thing to keep in mind, this class is for everybody. The severe weather um, is for everybody. Uh, when we go over the reporting procedures, uh, that's when you won't report to us that way. And what I mean is at the end of the class, you'll be considered a spotter. And if you're from outside of Eastern North Carolina, I will forward your information on to your local office. The procedures are likely the same, but your phone number and the email that you contact the office will be different. And we'll have more on that coming up. The focus is Eastern North Carolina. Uh, this is our office. The red dot is just outside of Moorhead City. Uh, we're about you know, a couple miles from the Atlantic Ocean itself. We do forecast for the adjacent sounds and oceans out to 20 nautical miles. So any of the offices along the West Coast, the East Coast, we do cover out into the ocean itself. We've got a few folks on from the central part of the state. Uh, the Raleigh office covers the central part of North Carolina. The Wakefield or the Richmond office covers far northeast North Carolina. And our sister office down to the south in Wilmington, North Carolina, covers the southeast part of the state. So a kind of a zoomed in perspective, those are some of the offices that cover the eastern half of North Carolina. No matter what office you saw on that map, we are open 24-7, 365 days of the year. These images are all from Hurricane Florence when our staff was there at least three days. Some of us were there seven because some of the damage that you we saw in the area. We are a safe building. Um, the offices along the coast, similar to ours, the lower left picture is a brick building and hurricane shutters. So we're, we're meant to stay in place. If we have any issues, we have backup offices, uh, but we are designed to stay when the weather gets bad to warn you. Uh, and that's why the buildings are designed for that. So that's a little bit about the weather service. Uh, main thing is protection of, of life and property. We're open 24-7. Skywarn is a national volunteer program run by the weather service. And the main goal is to produce ground truth reports of significant weather to us. And really what we mean by that is what is actually happening where you live? Is it worse than we think? Is it um, less than we think? Is that hailstone a half inch, three quarters of an inch? You're confirming exactly what's happening at the ground. Spotters really come in and play a, a big part in our warning process. We mentioned in the beginning, our main goal is protection of life and property. As a meteorologist, I have to issue warnings no matter what, whether I have a lot of spotter information or not. We have Doppler radar. It has dual pole capabilities, so we have a lot of technology. We have Go Satellite 16 that's very powerful. It can update uh, minute, minute by minute now. Uh, so we use all those resources, but spotters add credibility to the warnings by confirming it's actually happening. So an example would be, um, let's say we're watching a severe thunderstorm and it goes over Greenville and we get a lot of reports of P uh, to nickel sized hail. But the worst part of the storm is actually south of the city. Based on those reports, I know it's at least producing nickel sized hail and based on the radar, it's worse south of the city. So I'll, I would be able to surmise the storm is worse and perhaps need a warning. The other example, say the same thing, the storm moves over an area, we're getting ready to issue a warning and a couple spotters call in and say, hey, the hail's really not all that big. Maybe we don't issue a warning. We're not crying wolf and not issuing warnings when we don't need them. It's just as important. So you fill in the gaps and think about how often we get warnings on our phone. They're impacting somewhere, but unless it happens to you, you think, ah, oh, it'll never happen to me. But boy, if you see that next town over from you has had a tornado or has large hail, you're going to take it much more serious. So that's why we need that uh, those credible ground truth reports. I want to go over a couple definitions, uh, first starting with watches and warnings and what a severe thunderstorm is. For weather, any type of watch means conditions are favorable for it to happen. Any type of warning means it's happening or it's imminent. Uh, I'm, you've probably seen it on social media. I, I really like the analogy of cooking. Um, if you're making, let's say, brownies, you've got the, the brownie mix on the counter, the oil, uh, the water, a couple eggs. You know what's going to happen. The oven's preheating. Uh, you know what probably is going to happen, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. That's a watch. Conditions are all favorable for the brownies to be made, but it hasn't happened. 
In that same scenario, uh, let's say we upgrade to a warning. That means the brownies are in the oven, the timer's going off, it's ready to take out of the oven. All the ingredients that were in place came together. And that's the, one of the easiest ways to think about it. Uh, one interesting thing that people may not realize, a severe thunderstorm has certain criteria. It's wind and hail, one inch hail or 58 mile per hour winds. And we don't just make that up. That's about the threshold where you start to see damage. Um, you'll notice lightning is not in there. Doesn't mean that lightning's not dangerous. North Carolina has uh, been either third or fourth since the 1950s in terms of total deaths uh, because of lightning. Uh, but if we were to issue a warning every time there was a thunderstorm, lightning, uh, we would be issuing uh, most days uh, in the summer. So we do other things for that, including special weather statements. A couple other definitions, tornadoes and funnel clouds. And this is where I like to highlight what's important. Rotation, rotation, rotation. You got to be rotating if you're a tornado or funnel cloud. And then the difference between the two, if it's in contact with the ground, it's a tornado. If it's not in contact with the ground, it's a funnel cloud. But when you call in a report of either one of these, the first thing we're going to ask you, is it rotating? At the end of the class, I'm going to show you some very ominous looking pictures. I'm going to give you a quiz and it's going to be up for you to determine is that a tornado or funnel cloud? And again, the key with any of that uh, starts with, is it rotating? Want to go over our website and then we'll start to get into how thunderstorms form and some ingredients for them. Our website locally is weather.gov slash Newport. But whether you're watching from Wilmington or Cary or High Point or Honolulu, if you just go to weather.gov and click anywhere in the country where you live, that will take you to your local weather service. They have the same stuff, same layout. So again, just go to weather.gov for that. Once you're on your local website, click on the map, um, enter a city or zip code in the upper left, and you'll get a local forecast. And we kind of started off as a simplified forecast, and then you can dive down on the page and get more in-depth as you want. And this is what I mean. This is a forecast from the website. It's icon-based, uh, high and low. Is it gonna rain? Is it gonna snow? How warm is it gonna get? How cold is it gonna be, uh, get? And some subtle details out to seven days. If you scroll down the page and you click on the lower right, there's something called an hourly weather forecast. It's fantastic. Out to seven days, we have our hourly variables. Let's say in this case, you just wanna uh, know about temperatures, wind, and sky cover. That's the example there. Maybe you just wanna know about precipitation. Very useful forecast, again, for a user uh, that wants more in-depth information. If you scroll to the bottom of our website, you'll notice there's a couple icons. One is for Skywarn, and we'll talk about that at the end of the class. But one is for weather hazard briefings. A lot of offices, including ourselves, do these for active weather. Not talking day-to-day -day weather, we're talking the big stuff. Our example here on the left is Hurricane Florence. The example on the right is the snowstorm we had a couple winters ago. We use these briefings for our emergency managers, but also the public and social media to get out a five to 10 page document on what's upcoming, again, for big time severe weather. So we may only do this a couple times a year. Hopefully uh, that means the weather's quiet if that's the case. We love social media. We're on Facebook. Twitter and YouTube. All you have to do is search NWS Moorhead City. And again, if you're not from here, just search NWS in your local office. They'll be on social media as well. The reason why we like social media, we like to use it to jump up and down and say, this is what you should be focusing in on. The example on the left is Florence. It was certainly a bad storm for the Carolinas. Um, some folks, as the category went down, uh, maybe thought it wasn't as big of a deal. Uh, so we wanted to emphasize, this was posted the, uh, the morning of the storm itself, that the category of a tropical system is only, only related to wind. It says nothing about rainfall amount, wind speeds, uh, tornadoes, rip currents, how slow the storm's moving. Um, so social media we use. Uh, YouTube, uh, we put stuff like this up on YouTube. So this recording, if it all goes well, will be on YouTube. And we also do our briefings there as well. One last thing before we get into thunderstorms, mobile forecasts. While we don't have an official app, we do have a very good mobile site. It's mobile.weather.gov. You can add it to your iPhone or your Android uh, by saving it to your home screen. And when you do that, it will act very similar to uh, an app. It's free, easy to use, and it'll be a forecast from your local office. 
One more website that's good, the Storm Prediction Center, the men and women out in Norman, Oklahoma, work to issue an outlook out to eight days for severe weather. Uh, so they'll issue risk categories. Is it a slight risk, moderate risk? And then also in conjunction with the local office, uh, they will issue tornado watches and war uh, tornado watches and severe thunderstorm watches. Uh, so very similar to the Hurricane Center in the summer, uh, the Storm Prediction Center year round, uh, they are the experts on severe weather and work with the local office to keep uh, folks informed. So that's a little bit about the weather service. We're at about the 15 minute mark, just about 6.45. So we're doing well for time. Now we're gonna get into what causes thunderstorms. And I like to think of things as a recipe because just like your recipe, um, like we mentioned earlier, if you skip the eggs or the oil, probably not gonna turn out. Same thing with thunderstorms or really mother nature in general. You need moisture for the clouds and showers and thunderstorms. Uh, you need instability, which is fuel for those storms. And you need some type of lift, rising air in the atmosphere. Um, if you're missing one of those, you, you probably won't get storms. Or if you do, they won't be as bad as they otherwise could be. The first ingredient is moisture. Here in the Carolinas, we usually have plenty of this. It's not a lacking ingredient. We have the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean nearby. Um, since our winds are usually from the south, very, very humid. If you've lived here through any summer, you know how humid it can be. So moisture, um, that's like the, the couple loaves of uh, bread we have on the shelves, usually a staple, and we don't, uh, we're not lacking in terms of ingredients. One that we can be uh, lacking is instability. And this is especially true early in the season uh, when it's chilly and we just don't have a lot of uh, warm air around. Instability can be thought of as a couple different ways, but by and large, it's the fuel for the storms. Higher instability, more fuel, more potential. And we like to think of it in terms of warm and cold air. A couple of examples of that, a hot and humid day, it's very hot at the surface, it's 90 degrees. As you go up in the atmosphere, it gets cooler. The faster that happens, the faster the difference between the hot surface and the cool air aloft, the greater the instability because that, that air parcel is naturally going to want to rise fast. That's one type. The other type is we're hot and humid here and say even in Raleigh, but Asheville, a very strong cold front is coming through the Carolinas. Very warm air ahead of it, very cold air behind it. That clash of air masses can cause um, a big change in instability. And you may have seen this, unfortunately, with some of our severe weather outbreaks, um, they're often followed by cooler, drier weather. Uh, so you don't need to know so much the warm cold air thing. That Again, that's that science part. It's just more fuel for the storms. And the Coke bottle or soda bottle, whether you like Pepsi or Mountain Dew, whatever your favorite is, is a good example of that. At this point, we've got the moisture, which is the soda in this example. We've got the instability. You can see all the bubbles. But at this point, nothing's happened. We haven't, uh, we don't have our trigger to set everything off. So we have two of the ingredients, but now we need the last one. And those are fronts. Um, there are other types of um, lifting mechanisms. Areas of low pressure force air to rise. Uh, sea breezes force air to rise. Um, air going over the mountains, that's another lifting mechanism. But we'll focus on the two main ones, which are fronts. The first one is a cold front. With this diagram, it's a, a really nice one. You've got the cold air pushing in. Cold air is very dense, so the warm air that's out ahead of it is rapidly lifted. So from this diagram, you can see the thunderstorm is very tall. Uh, sometimes they can get up to 50, 60,000 feet tall. And because of that, they tend to produce more severe weather, large hail, and tornadoes. And for the students at home taking the class, uh, the cold front itself would be a blue line on the map with triangles, and those triangles always point in the direction it's moving. So that's a cold front, most likely scenario for severe weather. A warm front is the opposite, red line with half semicircles, and again, those always point to where the front's moving. In this case on the diagram, the cold air is in place. It does not wanna move. It's dense, it's not budging. The warm air being lighter comes in with the warm front and gradually rides up over the cold air in place. And this is a very subtle, it's very sloped. So we get showers and you can have thunderstorms. Um, you can have severe weather. You could have tornadoes. But notice compared to that previous picture, the clouds, instead of being very tall, they're very shallow and spread out. So your severe weather threshold is not quite as high for that to happen. All right. 
Now we're going to get into the different types of thunderstorms and what to report. This is the most important part. If you get anything out of this class, this is what we want you to, to pay attention to. If you live in eastern North Carolina, jot this number down. This is to call us for reports. If you don't live in our area, just hang tight. I will forward on your information to your local office. They will provide a number like this. The procedure will be the same, but you don't want to call a number that's not associated with your area. The procedure is always the same. Who you are, I'm a train spotter, what you saw, where you saw it, and when. It's important to know the timing because the first thing we're going to do is look at the radar. And let's say you took shelter and the storm was 20 minutes ago. That's, that's not a problem. Safety first. But if you say um, it, it happened right now and it was really 20 minutes ago, that's going to give us some confusion when we look at the radar and the storm is already over with. The reason why we prefer the 800 number is uh, this is a number that rings to our office. We answer 24-7 and we can ask you questions. So by far the most popular way for us that we want you to report severe weather is the 800 number. Can't say that loud enough. Now there are other ways you can report. We will go through that, but these are more supplemental ways. Again, not the first one. Our email is another good way. And again, if you're not from Eastern North Carolina, kind of just wait for uh, follow up from your local office. This is a good way to send us videos or pictures or to follow up that report. Hey, I got um, you know quarter size hail here uh, up toward Greenville, and I want to send you a picture. You would do that through the email address, but. Still stick to that procedure, who you are, what you saw, when and where. Uh, that way, in a severe weather situation, a lot of things are getting kind of crazy. We want clear, concise reports. Now we're getting to the, the fun part of the class, in, in my uh, uh, opinion. We're going to talk about the different types of thunderstorms. This is a great graphic. It goes from left to right. On the far left, we're going to talk about single cell or pulse storms initially, and then we'll get to supercells at the end. Um, with a single cell, we're going to introduce a couple more terms, but the first one is instability. We've mentioned it. You have some instability, um, maybe a decent amount of instability, um, but you don't have a lot of shear in the atmosphere. Shear is twisting in the atmosphere. It happens two different ways. One is uh, speed shear. As you go up with height, the winds get stronger quickly, or directional shear, winds differ as you go up with height. Either way, it causes a twist in the atmosphere. If you have instability but weak shear, you're tending to have single cells and weaker thunderstorms, and I'll, I'll explain why in a second. At the far end of the graphic, supercells, you tend to have the most instability and the most shear. You have that combination, um, that's where you get the worst storms. And we'll proceed one by one explaining uh, what we mean by that. I love to back things up with pictures. Uh, this is a pulse storm or single cell. Um, notice it's very in the vertical. What happens is it has the instability, it has the moisture in the lift, the showers and thunderstorms develop. But because there's she uh, no shear or little shear, it's very in the vertical. So as soon as it develops, it collapses on itself and the storm is over with uh, really quickly. This is a good example of this, the diagram on the bottom. Again, by the 10 minute mark, we're looking at it on radar. Uh, that red area indicates some hail, maybe some strong winds, uh, heavy rainfall. Um, it looks great in terms of potential for severe, but since it's in the vertical, as soon as it gets really good looking in terms of higher potential for severe weather, it collapses and by 15 to 20 minutes, it's already done doing what it needs to do. Uh, doesn't mean we can't get severe weather, but the, the threshold is usually lower. Doesn't mean we can't get a tornado, but these storms don't last long enough because they collapse on themselves to produce really large hail, really big tornadoes. These are the ones, if, if you're a gardener like me, you're watching them, you can't wait for the rain, and then they fall apart before they hit your house, and then down the road, a new one pops up. One thing you can get from pulse storms, pretty common is, is hail. It might not always be the largest hail, but you can get hail. Uh, we want any size hail reported to us. Um, if you can give a reference that's best, pea size, penny size, and you might think, well, you know, Eric, you said that one inch hail was severe. Why don't you just want to know about that? Remember, you're helping to gauge the storm. You may be in the weakest part of the storm, and if we know that, then we concur that uh, larger hail is occurring elsewhere. Whatever you do, especially if you say you took a class from Eric or you took a class from Moorhead City, don't use marbles for measuring hail. 
Uh, one reason is they differ in size. Um, so, you know, is it the green marble, the red marble? Which one is it? So, so do not use marbles. If you don't have a reference, uh, use a ruler. That would be fine. Um, and if you're going to send a picture, put a reference in the picture if you can. If you sent me the picture on the lower left with just large hailstones, I could probably surmise that's the size of a quarter. Could also be the size of a golf ball. It's hard to tell. But when you have a reference in the picture, that really helps out a lot. So in summary, report any size hail. Do not use marbles to report uh, hail size. Um, always do the largest hailstone. So an example would be, hey, we're getting a lot of nickel size hail, but we've got a couple the size of a quarter. All right, now we're switching things up. We're going down that graphic. Instability increases a little bit. Shear increases a little bit. And notice the image on the right, the animation, it's tilting because of, in this case, speed shear. Uh, the bar on the left is showing increasing winds with height. Because of that shear, the storm is tilted. And because it's tilted, it has the ability to last longer. Instead of 15 or 20 minutes, might be an hour or two, might be many hours. Instead of a, a one single cell, might be a line of cells, and it might go from Raleigh down toward Wilmington and Moorhead City. So when we get multiple cells and clusters and lines, it's because of that tilt uh, from the shear. And you can see the picture. It's a, an older picture, but it's bubbly. That's your instability. And notice instead of up and down, those clouds are tilted. Uh, when that happens, you can get a couple different things. You can get organized areas of heavy rain or wind. Um, any type of flash flooding we want to know about, sometimes the storms go over and over the same area. We call this training. So as far as flash flooding reporting, we want to know something significant, something you haven't seen before or, or it's pretty rare. Uh, we're not talking about the, the ponding of water that happens five, six times a year in the summer when it rains hard. Ideally, we want to know before it gets bad. Um, an example would be my, my creek is higher than I've ever seen before. Uh, the road has more water on it than I've seen before. Uh, in a worst case, you have flooding. Um, try to guess the depth. We certainly do not want you going outside with a ruler and measuring it. But is it up to the, the hubcaps of the car? Is it up to a stop sign? That type of thing. Remember, you're the eyes in the community. Uh, so let us know exactly what is happening. One good thing about um, rainfall reporting or flash flooding that can be specific are, is if you have a rain gauge. Uh, very, very useful. Uh, you can get these. Um, we certainly recommend different ones. Um, the very small ones, I call them test tube ga gauges that are only an inch apart at the top. Um, that's, that's not the best to get. An automated gauge would be a little bit better. And the best type of gauge would be a gauge from Coco Raws. And I'll talk about that here in a second. Let me see. Yes. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, our rough rule is two inches in a short period of time or in 24 hours. Uh, we're not going to be mad if you call with an inch and a half of rain. But um, the reason why we picked that number is you don't need to call in every raindrop. But if you have some significant rain, even if it's not flooding, call it in. Uh, that is certainly helpful to, uh, full, uh, to the local office itself. I mentioned Coco Raws. We are doing training um, the end of the month. I forget the exact date, but I'll show you the schedule again. Uh, we'll do training on this program. Um, this is something the Weather Service helps with. If you go to CocoRaws.org, you can purchase the rain gauge and put it up and start reporting today. They have some fantastic online training. You do, do not have to wait for us. Um, I really encourage folks that are trying to get their kids involved more into STEM, or um, perhaps you know you have people that want to get into meteorology. Uh, maybe you're retired and you have a lot of time and you're just interested in weather. It's a fantastic program. Uh, what you do is you measure and report precipitation every day. Um, in the morning, you can um, enter it in on an online website. You can download the app and do it. Uh, most days, I think about it, you're going to be entering zero. Uh, the days you have rain, you go out, measure it, uh, see how much, empty it out, and report it um, to through the Kokoros um, website or app, and we'll get that information at the uh, office itself. Great, great program. Can't say enough about it. So we talked about more shear and more instability could lead to um, heavy rain and training. It can also lead to dangerous winds, squall lines, derechos, um, things that produce a lot of wind. Uh, on the left is an example of a bow echo. Things in Mother Nature don't just happen. The reason why it's bowing out like that is because of strong winds, winds pushing it out. 
Sometimes you see a feature like this called a shelf cloud. Doesn't always mean severe weather, uh, but thunderstorms have um, an intake. Warm, moist air rises in the thunderstorm, and they have an exhaust where the cool, uh, rain-cooled air um, leaves the, the storm itself. And these can create sh uh, shelf clouds. This is a leading edge to that cooler air. Sometimes it can produce strong winds, though. We had an 82-mile-per-hour gust here a couple years ago down in Fort Macon um, as that shelf cloud approached. I, here's an example of, it's an older video. Um, you don't have the sound on it, but look at this. It, it looks like it could be a hurricane. You know, you could, it could be in the middle of a hurricane with this. This is a microburst. Um, you can have 80 to 100 mile per hour winds in a severe thunderstorm. A lot of times people see trees down and high winds and they automatically assume tornado. But again, what happens is you have very strong rising air in the atmosphere. And then at the front side of the storm, all that air descends. And if it descends all at once, uh, these downbursts, microbursts, hit the ground and can accelerate as they're doing that and cause a lot of damage and strong winds. That's what a severe thunderstorm is. It's not always that severe, but uh, that's that's the um, the you know how severe th uh, thunderstorms can produce damage. As far as wind damage is concerned, uh, we want to know, um, you know, are, are any trees down? How big are the branches? Uh, do you have any damage to the building? Um, you could estimate the wind speed. In our in-person class, we give kind of a, um, a little handout on how to do that. Uh, the only hesitation is sometimes we'll get a call and people will say, I think, I think we had 70 mile per hour winds, but then there's no damage. So we usually focus on, do you have damage or not? Uh, if you have an anemometer to measure wind speed, that would be fantastic. That would be the best. Uh, but if not, just give us the damage itself. That would be more than fine. If you're just joining us, again, in the beginning, we mentioned the 800 number is by far the most preferred way. We went over email. Uh, social media is another way, but again, we don't want you hopping on there to report something urgent like a tornado. Uh, we're big into social media, but we don't answer social media 24 seven like a phone. Uh, we, we, we answer a lot, but it, we just might miss a message. Um, if you're gonna do it that way, uh, a good way for pictures and videos for sure, who you are, what you saw, where and when same procedure no matter what office you're at all right we're going to turn it over to you here in a second for a couple questions before we do that we're at the far end of the graphic the most instability the most shear in the environment supercells um, i keep mentioning um you know thunderstorms have an intake and an exhaust looking from left to right on this diagram the left side the wind is very very strong coming into the thunderstorm and it goes straight up uh, these updrafts can reach 80, 100 miles per hour. Very, very strong. The stronger they are, the larger hail they can produce. So that's all that warm, moist air going up. That's actually in a supercell, the most likely area uh, for um, a wall cloud and eventually the possibility of a tornado. Now, the far right of that graphic, we call this the front side of the storm. And again, this is an idealized textbook looking at it. Um, the front side of the storm is the exhaust, all that rain cooled air heavy rain, gusty winds, and maybe some hail. So this would be the most likely uh, area for that. And I'm sure you've seen it. It gets dark, thunderstorms approaching, and then whoosh, you have that rush of wind, heavy rain, and maybe a little bit of hail. This is what it looks like from above a supercell. Um, the lower right is actually uh, what we call a hook echo. That's the radar picking up on, the reflectivity shows uh, particles, either raindrops, uh, hailstones, what have you. Uh, you're actually seeing the rotation uh, in the reflectivity there. Um, that's where we did have a tornado in November. Uh, 2018 was obviously a crazy year with Florence, but people may forget we had tornadoes after Florence, and that was, of course, the winter that was super cold. So that was a pretty wild uh, year here in eastern North Carolina. Most of our tornadoes, or at least right along the coast, we can get a lot of tornadoes during, during a tropical system. Doesn't have to be a hurricane. It could be a tropical uh, storm. Um, usually they tend to be weaker, uh, EF zeros and ones, um, but they often occur with very little notice. We'll see it on radar and it's happening. So that's the type of thing where we need to know about it. Uh, but luckily with tropical tornadoes, uh, most people aren't shopping. They're out hunkered down for the hurricane or the tropical storm that's gonna happen. If you live by the water, telling us about water spouts is very important. Um, water spouts do tend to be weaker than the land ones. You can have winds up to 100. You certainly don't wanna be on a boat with that, but compared to the ones you can see over land, they're not as strong. But, 
people are way more vulnerable because they're out on a boat or they're, they're at the beach. And on the whole scheme of things, they're very, very small in terms of meteorology. They're, they're not these huge things we can easily see on radar. So sometimes they're hard to detect. Uh, so that, again, encouraging you to make those reports to us. If you make a water spout, a tornado, a funnel cloud report, you have got to have rotation. We're gonna ask you a question coming up, so please remember that. Uh, what's the damage like? Be clear about when it's happening. Is it over the water? And of course, protect yourself first, and then you can tell us what happened after. Um, but again, we're gonna be asking about rotation because uh, sometimes you can be tricked uh, depending on uh, the type of uh, weather that's happening in your area. Another way to report is Twitter, uh, at NWS Moorhead City. Again, that's way low on the priority compared to the 800 number. Um, but same thing, who you are. In this case, with the character extension, you could say who you are. But just where you are, um, what happened in the time is more than sufficient. All right. So hopefully everybody's paying attention. We're almost done, and then we'll turn it over to you for questions. Um, so we are going to turn it over to you to try to answer this. I'm going to do a poll question. So if you're um, away from the computer, come on over, look at the computer. Uh, my question is, are these funnel clouds? The big hint is they are not rotating. But look at that one on the left. That looks, it's triangular. It looks, it looks pretty scary. Uh, so is that a funnel cloud? And the key is they are not rotating. So I'm going to open up a poll question, and you can answer it. Let's see. All right, so on your screen, you should see, see that you have uh, a poll question. Is this a funnel cloud? The key was it is not rotating, and I'll give you about 10 more seconds to answer. All right, looks like about 80% have, almost 90% have voted, fantastic. And the majority of you got it right. It is no. Um, you have got to have um, rotation for um, a tornado or funnel cloud. Um, you gotta have it. In this case, uh, since we don't have the rotation, it is not considered a funnel cloud. Uh, I know that cl the, the cloud on the left looks very scary looking, but you would just kind of see it hovering, slowly moving along. Uh, rotation is going to be clear. It's not going to be something that you have to kind of squint at. You're going to know it's rotating. When we talk about tornadoes, a lot of times we talk about their intensity. Uh, the Fujita scale, enhanced, uh, goes from zero to five, five being the strongest. Um, when we go out on a storm survey, we look for two things. Uh, the first thing is what's damaged. Um, that determines how strong the winds are. Was it a large tree? Was it a mobile home, a brick home, a hotel? What type of tree was it? Has it been raining? We look at all that, and we have a binder that engineers have put together that show a lower bound, an average, and an upper bound on those wind speeds. And we make a determination. It was estimated winds 70 to 80, 100 to 110, what have you. So the damage only tells us how strong the winds were. It uh, doesn't mean just because you have a lot of damage, you have a tornado. So first things first, how strong was it? Second is, what is the pattern of the damage? It is the pattern of the damage that tells us if it's a tornado or not. In this picture, um, with the trees uprooted, but they're convergent or coming together, that's indicative of a tornado. If everything's kind of laid down in the same direction, or even divergent, kind of a fan shape, so one's pointing this way, one's pointing that way, that's an indication that it was a microburst or strong winds. Sometimes it seems like people are disappointed uh, if it's not a tornado, meaning it's it's less of a thing, and that's just not true. Microbursts, again, can have winds up to 100 miles per hour. You can have a 100 mile per hour microburst and a 65 mile per hour EF0 tornado. So amount of damage doesn't determine what it is. It's the pattern, pattern, pattern. All right. One more quiz question. We'll do a summary. Uh, we're just about 710, so we've got five more minutes and we will wrap things up. Uh, so this one, again, look carefully at the screen. Is this a tornado or funnel cloud? Look really carefully at this picture. I'll give you a hint. This one is rotating. I know with still pictures, it's hard. Um, so if you ever send us pictures, you know, uh, try to do video or say, you know, it is actually rotating because from a still, it's hard to tell. But so tornado or funnel cloud, what do you think? It is rotating, so it's one of the two. And we'll do our second poll question. All right, is this a tornado or a funnel cloud? So yes, if it's a tornado, 
and no if it's a funnel cloud. So yes, if it's a tornado and no, if it's a funnel cloud and we already know that it is rotating. Fantastic, I appreciate everybody uh, answering. We had 94% voting, so that's that's a lot. Uh, and, and almost every single person said yes, very, very good job. Uh, that is a tornado. Some of you might, you know, that said no might say, you know, I couldn't see it. But if you look very carefully, this is just to emphasize, um, notice the debris or dust down at the bottom, that indicates that the, the circulation goes all the way to the ground. A little bit of a trick question, because it's hard to see, but the emphasis there is, is it in contact with the ground or not? So really, really good job. I appreciate, we have a lot of people on the, the talk tonight. I really appreciate that. One last way to report is MPing. It's a map that you can download. Um, this is more, this really helps a lot in the winter time, but you can do hail and high winds and things of that nature. Um, but again, the priority would be to call us on that 800 number. As we wrap things up, your reports are crucial to us. More reports give us a clearer picture. We have to issue those warnings no matter what. We have a pretty good idea of what's going on, but you can fill in the gaps on what's going on. Um, Real-time reports are what we want, um, but when we get back to normal, we get back going to our vacations and stuff like that, let's say you come home and you just went to Myrtle Beach for the week and you see trees down, we want to know about it. Uh, but just be really clear, because if you call the office and say, hey, I've got trees down in Jacksonville uh, and it's sunny out today, we're not going to believe the report. So just say, hey, I'm a train spotter in Jacksonville. Uh, we just went on a family vacation. Uh, again, as things get back to normal. And um, I just wanted to let you know about this. And we'll look at the radar archive to know what's going on. A lot of people think we know what's going on already. If it's a massive storm, uh, this is a tornado up in Greene County by Snow Hill. Um, a lot of times we don't. Uh, power's out, lines are out. So if you have that information, you may be the only one to report it to us. 800 number, again, is the preferred way. If you're joining us from across the country, uh, please um, wait for the follow-up from your local office. You know how to report, you know when to report, you just need your local number. So in summary, tornadoes, funnel clouds, got to confirm rotation. Uh, we went, went over wind damage and flooding and heavy rainfall. If you've got a gauge, please let us know rainfall amounts. It can help us kind of calibrate the radar to see how it's doing with rainfall estimation. Uh, we mentioned the 800 numbers preferred. There are other ways like social media and our email. That would be best for videos and pictures. When should you not call us? A non-severe report, something non-specific. You, you think you're being helpful. Hey, it's raining a lot. It's really windy. And we really appreciate the enthusiasm. But without something concrete as, as far as damage or a confirmed uh, wind gust or rainfall amount, it doesn't help. And lightning, we have a great lightning detection system. So we know where the lightning is. Uh, that does not need to be reported. Our goal here in Moorhead City is to make you a year-round spotter. That's why we have a lot of different classes. Uh, we just finished up our winter one, but as you think about next fall and winter, if you get any amount of snowfall, we want to know about it um, to the nearest tenth of an inch. The goal with that is, thankfully, it's unlikely you're going to see a tornado. It's unlikely you're going to have a lot of hail. You might have some hail. Um, it's way more likely you're going to report rainfall or snow to us. Uh, so we want you to become a year-round spotter. You can do that by taking our future classes. Uh, this is the basic spring class. You're just about done with that. We have an advanced class later this month and April. I think it's just April. Um, that's a follow-up to this. We go more in depth on dual pole radar, uh, radar structures, and things of that nature. So a little bit more meat. Uh, on the class in terms of meteorology. We have a flood sky warn where we go over rain gauges and flood history, tropical sky warn uh, as well. So a lot of training for you. We always put this information on our website and um, we send it out to our spotter list, uh, usually at the beginning of the year, so they're aware of it. Keep current, please bookmark our website. And again, you're gonna get a PDF of this presentation or uh, of the website itself which has the presentation and you're going to get all these numbers and our website so bookmark it if you know of a young person that missed the talk today a neighbor that loves weather send them this uh, all this training is on our youtube channel and it's recorded um, posted on our website so you can take this whenever you want one last thing is my email it's on the bottom eric hayden at noaa.gov 
Um, you can jot it down, but again, um, we're teleworking a lot of us from uh, the weather service at this point with what's going on. So when I'm back on shift from home, I am home today. So this is not, not the weather service here. Thanks to my wife for keeping the kids quiet. You didn't hear any crazy noises. Um, send me an email and you'll have my email address here uh, when I email you tomorrow. Last thing before I turn it over to you all for questions. Again, if you have a question, ask it through the webinar. Um, and then uh, you can raise your hand. If you've got a microphone, you got a good question, I will uh, call on those that raise their hand and we'll do it that way. We're at 7.15, so we're done. So you can drop off if you need to put the kids to bed or you're done with the class, you've, you've already done it. Uh, I do wanna end with our website and the upcoming classes. Um, again, we have a basic Skywarn Wednesday afternoon for those that missed it. Um, our advanced class is the last day of March. And then we have another one Friday, April 10th. Same thing. If you were able to log on to this with no problems, you'll be able to do that without any problems as well. So I'll leave that up, our website, and I'm going to turn it over to you for questions now. Again, if you need to drop off, that's not a problem. It's 7.15, so we'll say 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll wrap things up. So I'm going to go to the chat window first. Let's see if we got any questions in there. Wow. Hi from Honolulu, Mark, that's awesome. So uh, I won't say last names, but Mark joined us from Honolulu, Hawaii. Send some of that nice weather. You don't know how cool that is, Mark, because we do these classes all the time and we always open them up for everybody. Um, you know, the majority that take them are from Eastern North Carolina, um, but we, we don't we don't care if, if other people want to join us. Uh, but we have never, ever, ever had somebody from Hawaii. So that is that is really cool. Uh, Vicky says she's here. So very good. So, again, ask a question in the chat if you or in your uh, question feature. Nobody else sees it. So you don't have to worry if you think it's a silly question. Um, if not, you can click raised hand on the webinar and I will call on you. Um, and we'll unmute your line. Right now you're muted. So I see I see Mark does have, let's see, we have Ben Broxton. So let me get down to you, Ben. Let me see. All right, so Brett, uh, Ben didn't raise his hand, so I'm not sure if he wants to be called on. I'll just uh, ask it out loud. Again, if you want to be called on and you have a mic, uh, iPad, iPhone, Android, anything with a mic, you, you can ask the questions uh, verbally. Uh, so we got a question. Should you report scud clouds? How about water spouts? Ben, really good question. As far as those scud clouds, scattered cumulus under deck, those are those low hanging clouds that look threatening, but they're not rotating. So you don't, you do not need to report those. Uh, we hear about them a lot because untrained spotters think they're, they're tornadoes or funnel clouds. And that certainly sends alarms to us. Uh, but yeah, you don't need to report those because they're not rotating. And water spouts, yes, we definitely want to know about those. It's a type of tornado over the water. So we, we would certainly want to know that. So again, ask a question through the webinar if you've got it. If you want to ask a question through uh, the audio on your uh, computer or mobile device, just raise your hand and I will call on you. Let's see here. All right, so we've got we've got uh, David J. I'm going to unmute your mic, Mike. All right, David, everybody can hear you. Uh, so David J. That just raised his hand. Uh, fire away with your question. So which city in the U.S. has had the most tornadoes? I'm having a little which bit of trouble. Okay, there you go. I, I got you, David. Okay. Yes. Yeah, wh which city in the U.S. has had the most tornadoes? Wow. Younger people always ask the hardest questions, David. He asked what city has the most tornadoes. I'm not sure off of the top of my head, David, but I would say the most likely ones are across certain parts of our country. So one part of the country we call Tornado Alley. I'll try to Google it real quick so we have an image to put up. Uh, so we call this Tornado Alley. It typically extends from Nebraska down through Kansas and Oklahoma into te Texas. So that would be one. Um, let me see if I can get an image for you. That would be one location, uh, David, that asked the question. So Norman, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, uh, those types of areas um, would be more likely for tornadoes. The other um, kind of hot spot is across the southeast part of the country, uh, up toward the Ohio Valley. So places like Mississippi and Alabama, 
uh, they can have a lot of tornadoes as well. So uh, to answer that question, specific cities would be tough, but if you're looking at your screen, David, um, this is the chance of one day in a decade, decade significant tornado alley, 60% chance. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it uh, highlights the area. So North Texas, from really from Dallas northward, so uh, places like Dallas, David, Oklahoma City, Norman, Wichita, um, Grand Island, um, Omaha, Nebraska, um, those, those types of places, even into eastern Colorado uh, stands a chance for tornadoes. And then again, the southern states, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, kind of another bullseye there as well. So really good question, David. Uh, when you're done answering your questions, see if you can unraise your hand uh, so that I don't call on you uh, twice. And David, you did a great job with that. Um, if anybody else wants to ask that way, you can certainly do it. All right, uh, so we got a question from Sherry. How can I tell the difference between a regular cloud that looks threatening and a funnel cloud or tornado? Sherry, great uh, question. Uh, so the big key with that is rotation. So uh, if it's rotating, it's going to be more threatening because it's the potential to be a tornado or funnel cloud. Um, as far as the darkness of a cloud, um, that's an indication that you have some heavy rain uh, because you're, you're the raindrops are actually blocking out the sunlight. So just, just a darkening of the cloud at least indicates rain, um, but it's hard to surmise if there's wind or, or anything from it. So I would say for that, uh, rotation is your key. Uh, determine if it's uh, significant. Another key is is thunder. Uh, you should be inside as soon as you hear thunder. But um, if you if there's a lot of lightning with a storm, that's a, a good indication. It's a strong storm. May not have a tornado. May not be the worst storm you've ever seen. But the more lightning you have, the worse sometimes it can be. That's a good question, Sherry. Oh, this is awesome. Kindle, I, I hopefully I said your name right. Uh, this is fantastic. So everybody listen up to this because I know we have a, a crazy situation going on. We're all doing the best we can. Uh, we've always done these classes, but it's kind of a way to hopefully keep things as normal as possible. Uh, that's why we expanded this. And Kendall uh, said that, you know, thank you so much. I'm nine years old. So we have a nine-year-old on this call. Uh, she's from uh, Wallace. Um, and this is her science for the day, and she loves weather. So Kendall, uh, great, thank you very much for joining us. Um, for you and everybody else, when I send you your certificate, print it out, show me that you you post it and you're you know that that you're you're using that certificate. Uh, I will um, in the bottom of the email there also be links how to become a meteorologist, schools that offer meteorology, um, and then in the weather service, I'll show you right now. Uh, we have some folks at the headquarters level that work a lot with outreach. So weather.gov is our website, but Kindle and anybody else, if you go to weather.gov slash learning, and again, if, if you don't have time to jot it down, this will be in your email tomorrow. Um, I send you a bunch of nice links. So weather.gov slash learning, there's a lot of great information here. Uh, at first, there's some quick links. If you scroll down, uh, Jetstream is awesome. It's an online school for weather, so you can take different things. Uh, here's our cloud chart. And then toward the bottom, there's different um, private companies that we've worked with or will point you in that direction where there's a lot of cool information. One of them, um, the comment site, you can actually take classes and get credit for it. I mean, it's, it's amazing what we have access to uh, versus when I was a kid. A hot seat. Uh, one of our coworkers, Mike, he had signed up for that and said it was it was pretty challenging. So uh, if you want to know what it's like to issue warnings, you could download that. Uh, create a cane, weather lab. These are games and uh, interactive things you can play. So uh, just uh, fantastic uh, information. Again, weather.gov slash learning. Um, and I think, Kendall, you inspired other people to speak up because we talked about Mark. Again, all the way in Honolulu, Hawaii. I just can't get over that. Mark, I mean, we're, we're three miles. Where I am right now, I'm three miles from the Atlantic Ocean, and you're, you're way out in Hawaii. It just, it just blows my mind. Mark is nine as well. So how, how cool is that? So very cool. David J. Uh, asks, are there any weather offices in Alaska? And the answer is yes. So uh, in the very beginning, we showed you a map. Uh, there's over 100 offices in the country. So here's the weather.gov, that's our website. And again, you're gonna get these links. You can click anywhere on the United States and we can click up toward Alaska. 
And there's a couple different offices. I'm not familiar with all the names, so I might get some wrong. But there's Fairbanks. Uh, I think there's one in Anchorage, and there might be one in Juneau as well. Um, so that I'm not as versed on, but I know Anchorage, Fairbanks, and um, and I think Juneau are at least the three. But there might be more. So if anybody's watching from Alaska, um, you can chime in. But yes, there are offices up there, and same type of thing. You can click on the map and uh, get the forecast up there very very good so let's see we got those i'm gonna make sure a couple more and then we'll wrap things up let's see so again you can ask them for through the webinar feature and i think i got everything in the webinar so let's see if anybody has their hand raised all right i think i think we might be through everything i don't see anybody's hand raised and i don't see any more questions let's see all right, so if you have a question, ask, or we're going to wrap things up. It's about 7.25. We said about 10 minutes, so I think that's pretty good. Um, if you think of something and you forgot to ask it, just email me. You're going to have my email uh, here tomorrow um, if you didn't already jot it down at the end of the presentation. I'll load that back up in case anybody needed it. Make sure I do the right slide. All right, so my email is at the bottom um, if you want to ask me anything afterwards. I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, share this with teachers and other people looking for science. Um, a recording will be placed on YouTube, and uh, our previous one that we did last week is already there. So again, if you have somebody interested, uh, you can thank us by sharing our website. Um, it's hard to get all that information out. So if you really enjoyed this and you really want to thank us, please share our website. We have space for a thousand people. Um, so I want as many people on here as possible. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Mark and Kendall and some of the other young folks um, that um, joined us. One last question from Vicki was, can teachers get uh, CEUs for this? I'm not sure. Um, not, I'm not a teacher, so I don't know how that works. What I would say is um, you're gonna get a certificate um, if you want to have them email me to say, yes, it was about an hour and the stuff we went over, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, so just let me know. And you might be able to, Vicki, on that comment site, some of those links where you actually get course credit, you, you might be able to get some credit that way. So, um, so email me as a follow up if I can help in any way. So that is it. We don't have any more questions in the chat. And we don't have any more on the webinar. So we're going to wrap things up. Appreciate you joining us from my home. And we will see you again. Again, share away. Let everybody know what we're doing here out of the Moorhead City office. Have a great night, everybody.